Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Louise Woodward? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Louise Woodward was born in England in 1978. Her parents were named Gary and Susan. She grew up in the town of Elton. It was described as a sleepy town that did not have a lot of activities that were exciting for teenagers. In June of 1996, Louise traveled to the United States with the intent of spending a year there. This was in between high school and college. She worked as an au pair for the Epen family in Newton, Massachusetts. This is just outside Boston. Sonny and Deborah Epen were both physicians. Sonny was an anesthesiologist and Deborah was an ophthalmologist. Louise cared for their two children, Brendan and Matthew. It appears as though Louise might have been having a little too much fun in the Boston area. She went out at night and socialized all the time. She was frequently late getting to work in the morning. She saw the theater production Rent at least 20 times. On January 30, 1997, Sonny and Deborah Epen met with Louise to have a serious conversation about her job performance. Essentially, they told her she was doing a terrible job and they were going to fire her if her behavior did not change. If she was fired, she would have to leave the United States and the party would be over. The couple had Louise sign an agreement that contained a number of rules that she would follow. For example, she was not allowed to use the computer, she had to be on time for work, and she could spend no more than five minutes on the phone. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. According to Louise, on February 4, 1997, at 2.30 p.m., she gave eight-month-old Matthew Epen a bath. He was cranky and crying during this process. He had been generally irritable for some time, and his appetite had changed. At 3.45 p.m., Louise Woodward called 911 to report that Matthew was not responsive. He was transported to the hospital with serious brain, skull, and eye injuries. He fell into a coma and underwent emergency surgery. Investigators found evidence of prior injuries as well. The police visited the Epen family residence and questioned Louise. She said that she had tossed Matthew on the bed. She was a little bit angry. She then dropped him on a towel and was a little rough with him. She admitted that she had lightly shaken Matthew. The next day, Louise Woodward was arrested and charged with assault and battery. According to the police, she had been quite calm and composed prior to being arrested, but now she was nervous. On February 9, Matthew was removed from life support after physicians determined that recovery was not possible. Investigators concluded that he had died from shaken baby syndrome after observing retinal hemorrhages. Luis was charged with first-degree murder. The case drew international attention. There was a particular amount of interest not only from the United States, but from the United Kingdom. On October 30, 1997, Luis Woodward was convicted of second-degree murder. The jury had deliberated for 26 hours. On October 31, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Now, in the state of Massachusetts, a judge has the power to change a jury's verdict. In the days following the sentence, Louise Woodward's defense attorneys filed post-conviction motions. Second-degree murder requires intent. The judge did not believe that Louise had intent. Less than two weeks after her conviction for second-degree murder, the judge reduced the conviction to involuntary manslaughter. Here's what he said in reference to his decision. Quote, the circumstances in which the defendant acted were characterized by confusion, inexperience, frustration, immaturity, and some anger, but not malice in the legal sense supporting a conviction for second-degree murder. I am morally certain that allowing this defendant on this evidence to remain convicted of second-degree murder would be a miscarriage of justice." Unquote. He modified her sentence to 279 days, which was the amount of time she had served. She was released from custody. Prosecutors filed an appeal. Luis was not permitted to leave the United States until that resolved. 
The appeal was unsuccessful. Louise returned to the United Kingdom. She graduated from college in 2002 and eventually pursued a career as a ballroom and Latin dance teacher. At some point, she married. In 2014, she had a daughter. Now moving to my analysis. Shaken baby syndrome is a controversial diagnosis that comes up from time to time in criminal cases. Physicians and researchers disagree about whether the syndrome actually exists, and there are strong feelings on both sides of the issue. Some people from each side accuse the other side of irrational thinking. The theory behind this syndrome is that if a particular triad of symptoms is observed in an infant, then shaking must have occurred, even if there are no external signs of injury. The three symptoms are brain swelling, bleeding on the surface of the brain, and bleeding behind the eyes. Essentially, those who support the syndrome as legitimate are saying that there is no other explanation for those symptoms other than shaking. That's what causes this particular symptom profile. Those who are skeptical believe there are other possible causes for those three symptoms appearing at the same time. For example, earlier injuries, perhaps caused by an accidental fall, strokes that occurred in utero, and infections. The skeptics are not necessarily implying that shaking can't be one cause. Rather, they are saying that there could be other causes. The triad is not a valid diagnostic indicator. With this in mind, let's move to the next question. Was Louise Woodward guilty of second-degree murder or involuntary manslaughter? Again, she was originally convicted of second-degree murder, but the judge changed the verdict to involuntary manslaughter. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory factors. Louise, and only Louise, was responsible for Matthew's care when his medical condition dramatically changed. She admitted to tossing him on the bed, dropping him on a towel, and lightly shaking him. When she testified in court, she said that she popped him onto the bed. The prosecution made a big deal of this, but I think this simply represents a difference in the way English is spoken in the UK versus the US. It is clear that by the word popped, she meant she placed Matthew on the bed. A neuroradiologist named Patrick Barnes testified that Matthew's injuries were consistent with shaken baby syndrome. Matthew had a two and a half inch fracture on the back of his skull, a subdermal hematoma, and retinal detachment. He testified that there was no evidence of prior injury. A detective said that Luis never asked how Matthew was. She never inquired about his condition as if she did not care. She appeared calm and was not shaking. At the time of the incident, Louise was upset with Matthew's parents. Even though she agreed to spend no more than five minutes on the phone, she spent over two hours on the phone the day of the incident. In addition, Deborah Epen said that Louise was late to work every single day that week. So I guess she wasn't really concerned too much about the ultimatum issued by Sonny and Deborah. During direct examination, Luis was asked by her attorney, did you slam Matthew Epen? Luis smiled and slightly laughed as she said no. I don't think this should be inculpatory, but we later find out that the jury was influenced by this behavior. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. The prosecution's theory of the crime was that Matthew was shaken, then slammed into an object, yet he did not have any bruises on his body, and there was no swelling at the site of the skull fracture. There was some evidence that he had been injured before. Several physicians, including neurosurgeons and the famous forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden, testified that Matthew's injury was not fresh. It appeared as though he had an old subdermal hematoma. The symptoms that he had prior to the 911 call, including being lethargic, irritable, and not eating, are consistent with this old hematoma bleeding again. Louise Woodward could not have known the significance of these symptoms, yet these are the symptoms she described. If she did not observe these symptoms, how did she know about them? The physicians also said there was evidence of bone healing, which again suggests an old injury. Michael Bodden said that Matthew's injuries were not caused by shaking. Many years after the trial, Dr. Patrick Barnes, who was the key witness for the prosecution, doubted his testimony. 
He said that in school he learned about the triad, but later came to doubt its validity. He said he should not have testified about it at the trial. Essentially, he's saying that he was wrong in his testimony. The fact that Louise was smiling and laughing a little bit during her testimony can be attributed to anxiety. Smiling and laughing do not indicate guilt. She was pretty scared about the whole life in prison possibility. I imagine that the prison theater production of Rent just didn't have the same quality as the one that she saw in Boston. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Louise Woodward was guilty? I believe she was not guilty of second-degree murder and not guilty of involuntary manslaughter beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe that in reality, she was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. So the prosecution was simply unable to make its case. It seems clear that Louise did do something to harm Matthew, but what she did will never be known. Years after the trial, two of the jurors were interviewed for a documentary that aired in the United Kingdom. It's clear from these interviews that the members of the jury did not believe Louise Woodward was guilty of murder. There was a situation that occurred before deliberation that put Louise in a bad position. She had to choose if the jury would be able to consider involuntary manslaughter. Like, would that be an option? Could they vote guilty for that charge? So maybe they weren't too keen on the idea of murder. This would allow them another option. Louise decided to stick with murder or acquittal as the only possibilities. So she was going to be found guilty of murder or acquitted. Involuntary manslaughter was not on the table. The members of the jury decided that Louise was guilty of something, and because they could not choose involuntary manslaughter, they convicted her of second-degree murder. This is not what they were supposed to do. It was not in their power to upgrade her from a charge they could not consider to one which they could consider. One jury member said the jury was not comfortable with not guilty. Juries are required to make decisions that are not comfortable. Moving to the last question, is shaken baby syndrome a valid construct? The evidence is mixed regarding the syndrome, but overall, I believe that the skeptics make a good argument about how there is little proof the construct is valid. The syndrome may very well be real, but it has not been established scientifically. One of the difficulties with this particular syndrome is that conducting experimental research would be unethical and illegal. Without experimentation, Expert witnesses rely on their experience only, which may or may not represent the truth. I think this is another example of expert witnesses relying on their feelings instead of the evidence. This is an area that cannot be easily studied. This creates a vacuum of knowledge, which is quickly populated by speculation and strong emotions. Those are my thoughts on the case of Louise Woodward. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.